Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, coming out early to, to see me. And thanks to Alex and Peter for inviting me to be here and, and uh, start things off. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the future of robotics. I think we're at a, a very interesting time in robotics right now. It's sort of, I, it's sort of like, you know, it's the beginning of the 19th century and we, we figured out how to build locomotives, but we haven't figured yet out how, what the train station's going to look like, the, whether, whether we have marshalling yards, building tunnels, etc. So it's very early uh, in robotics. It's sort of a golden age for invention of how people will use robots. And in the talk today, I'm going to show you, try and explain to you what I believe we are going to need lots and lots and lots of robots over the next 50 years. But we have to figure out how we're going to interact with them, how we're going to use them. In computation, that also happened. And, uh, you know, there were some pioneers, Ada Lovelace, came up with the idea of having a sequence of things, a sequence of configurations of a machine in order to do a computation. She didn't have branching, but, you know, it was uh, almost 200 years ago, so I, I forgive her for that. Um, so she was a pioneer. Another pioneer is uh, Grace Hopper. When machines were just getting off the ground and every machine was totally different in the way you programmed it, she came up with the idea, and you can see it in her right hand there, the idea of a, a high-level language which translated down to different machines but made all the machines look, look the same. She, she invented programming languages with COBOL. Um, uh, uh, Douglas Engelbart came up with new ways to interact with machines, the mouse, um, pointers, the idea of clicking on something and going down to a deeper level. If you ever want to see a, an amazing demo, look for um, Mother of All Demos on YouTube, and there's a one and a half hour video made in 1968 uh, of him showing how to use the mouse and interaction on screen. It's an amazing thing that he put together. And then people like Steve Jobs, who you know, figured out how to take all the good ideas um, and turn them into real products. So these people really changed how we use computers, changed what they were. Um, and in robotics, all these positions that those people took are still open. We haven't done any of these things yet. So please, all of you out there, aspire to be these people. But remember the following. What did these people have in common? None of them worried about getting tenure. <laughs> Don't worry about tenure. It's overrated. None of them worried about getting their next paper accepted. That's overrated too. <clears throat> they didn't worry about what other people thought of them. They went out and did stuff. And they didn't worry about how big or impossible what they wanted to do was. So have big dreams is my, is my uh, message to you. They all wanted to make computation real in the world. They wanted to make it more flexible. They wanted to make it more accessible. And they, they wanted to get their ideas out there. So that's sort of the theme of my talk. Think big, do big things. Don't do little career-y things. Now, I've, I've, uh, you know, uh, Alex talked about me getting robots out into the world. It's actually well over 20 million Roombas now. Um, I'm no longer with the company. Um, but uh, we also, and this company spun off to a new company called Endeavor Robotics, about 6,500 military robots uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, first looking in caves and then dealing with roadside bombs. And then my new company, Rethink Robotics, Soya is our main product now, thousands of these out in, in factories. And what do these have in common? They have in common that the people that interact with them they know nothing about robots. They take them out of the box. They've never seen a paper at an ICRA. Um, they, don't care, they don't know ICRA exists. Uh, they've got something they want to do. They want their floor clean. They want to uh, deal with roadside bombs. Or they want to get something automated in their factory. They know nothing about robots. Those two guys on the right there, are from a little uh, factory in Connecticut. They're both machinists. When, they were, when the company decided to get robots, the machinists were told, figure out how to use the robot. And they figured out how to use the robot and get it doing tasks in the, in the factory. The, the guy in the middle with, the, with his robot in the military, we, we, we uh, packed up those robots. We had manuals in them. We found out later that the uh, US military removed the manuals before they sent the robots to Afghanistan and Iraq. And people took them out of the box with no training and had to deal with them. 
And um, I'll show you an example in a minute. People getting Roombas never, ever, ever look at the manual. I guarantee it. And Apple has realized that, so Apple don't have manuals anymore. So, uh, so these, um, my current robots are, are uh, used in factories. I've spent the last 10 years going into factories, talking to people in factories, seeing what's difficult, what's easy. And these are just a, a few uh, little uh, uh, things of, of the Sawyers at work in the various factories. And the important thing here is the people who got these robots to do these things are not programmers, they're not roboticists, they didn't write a single line of code to get this to happen, but we had to figure out a way so that they could get the robots to do fairly difficult, sometimes tasks, use force control, um, use uh, uh, computer vision. You'll see in a minute this uh, flashing a light and uh, it, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna go and uh, read some barcodes there. It's also use, used for localization, getting a local coordinate system from vision, et cetera. So, this is what I've been doing the last few years of, of, of getting robots so that they could do these sorts of things and that ordinary people who know nothing about robots could get them to do that. So end users are very different from robotics researchers. And often, as robotics researchers, we think, oh, the user can just do this. Oh, the user can just do that. But if you're thinking the user can just do something, you're outsourcing the hard problems to the end user, and ultimately it's not gonna work. Um, let me give you some examples. Well, first, um, it takes a long time to get from lab to product. This was the first robot vacuum cleaner my lab built in 1992. Um, all the dirty air got sucked through the computer boards. It wasn't a good design. Um, first came out in 2002, our, our first uh, uh, vac robot vacuum cleaner. <coughs> it wasn't the first one. Uh, Henrik Christensen is here. He worked on the um, Electrolux uh, Trilobite which was the first robot vacuum cleaner. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. And it still took a lot of, of stuff to make them truly useful because the manual said clean the brushes every month. I don't know anyone who ever cleaned the brushes of a Roomba, but it eventually got really bad. And it wasn't until 2013 a mechanical solution came along for that. And that's interesting, it was a mechanical solution. Robotics is not just software attached to motors, there's mechanism too. But, <clears throat> the uh, evolution of the, Ro the Roomba interface. Um, first, we did do some user studies before we built the first Roomba. But our user study was not how to use it. Our user studies was, we went into malls and we asked people, how much can you spend on an impulse purchase without having to get your spouse's permission? And we graphed that. And, uh, some $200, around $200, seemed to be what the middle class in malls thought they could spend. Henrik's robot was 2,000 euros at the time. Uh, we decided, well, we're gonna sell this thing for $200. Um, so we started a spreadsheet with $200 on the bottom right-hand corner, took out the margin for the distributors, that got to a cost of goods sold, took out uh, manufacturing, that got to the bill of materials, and then that got to you know, what we could put in the robot to make that $200 come out. And I remember, you know, intense arguments. Uh, we need that sensor, but that sensor is gonna cost an extra penny. And if you put that in the spreadsheet, it breaks it in the bottom right-hand corner. That was our user study. But we, we made some mistakes. There was an on-off switch, a rocker switch. We were just inundated with telephone calls. Which way's on, which way's off. To us engineers, seemed fine. But our really stupid mistake was this, that this, these three buttons, S, M, and L. That was for a small room, a medium room, and a large room, obviously. <laughs> What's a small room? Is this a medium room or a large room? I'm not sure. <laughs> that, was, that was bad. So over time, the, the interface uh, changed to, uh, you see on the bottom right what it's like today, there's one button that says clean. <laughs> now there are some other buttons, little buttons down there that you can go in and program it to come out at certain times of the day but clean is, is the major control. Um, now, we, uh, we also, you know, people use them for weird things, but uh, <laughs> we also have these things called, uh, and they're still sold with Roombas, uh, virtual walls. These are little devices that you, you wanna block the, the robot from going down a corridor, you put this, put this device uh, uh, there, and it just sits there forever, and when the robot comes nearby, 
communicates wirelessly, it activates, sends out an, an infrared beam, and the robot doesn't go past it. And we had it in a manual in the box. And in particular, we had it localized for every region. So Henrik, again, we had a Danish version of the manual in the once we sold in Denmark. Um, and we, we, you know, we were out trying to understand our customers, and we heard about this chain of elder care homes in southern Denmark where they were using Roombas as their primary cleaning device. And so one of our guys went to see it, and what did he find there? Well, there was a woman in charge of the Roombas, she had two of them, and so when she turned them on, you know, there are these things in the box besides the Roomba, these virtual walls. So, of course, she put them on top of the Roombas. <laughs> <laughs> but this actually turned out to be great. It made them into Breitenberg vehicles where they ran away from each other, and it actually made them spread out and clean the place better. It was, it was fantastic. <laughs> but the point is, if you're trying to build robots for the real world, the real world isn't anything like your lab, and the people, and the, the people who use them are not like people in your lab. Now, here's a review of the Roomba. Um, and we used to get this all the time. Uh, people would complain. It, it had to, they had to watch at the robots for so long as it cleaned the room because it went around randomly. And you see, uh, for instance, I think it should hug a straight line back and forth across a room like with normal vacuuming or lawn mowing. Now, I know for lawn mowing you go in straight lines because that's what the lawn looks like afterwards, but I don't think people go in straight lines for vacuuming. They sort of go, and actually that's good because you're changing the direction relative to the nap of the carpet and it makes for better cleaning. But the world said, we hate it that it goes randomly. So after I'd left the company, iRobot invested a lot and put vSLAM in there, has a camera, looks up at the ceiling, out of the box in anyone's home, it can figure out, does slam in real time, and then it goes in nice straight lines back and forth across the carpet. Now here's a... Here's the sort of review it gets. Even the, the 980, that's the model, boasts an array of smart features and costs $200 more. What are you, you know, it's slam, you know. <laughs> it doesn't perform as well as the old Roomba. No, it doesn't, because random was good. <laughs> so, getting robots to work for real people is, is difficult. Um, but we're going to need more robots. And we're going to need more robots because of some mega trends. Some mega trends in the world, things that are changing in our world, which we sort of have lost control of. Um, they're happening before our eyes, and they're going to continue to happen. And I want to talk about these, th some of these mega trends, three of them in particular, that I want to talk about, and how I think that's going to impact robotics. First is the demographic inversion. I'll come back to that uh, later. This is data from Japan showing people getting much older. Um, climate change, we all know about. Um, and urbanization. In the next 50 years, we're going to double the, amount, number, the peop, number of people in cities around the world. Incredible construction tasks ahead. Um, so let's talk about that in a little more detail, demographic inversion. Um, <clears throat> this is Europe in 1950. Left side is men, right side is women, five-year uh, intervals, uh, age intervals. And let's what happen, see what happens, 1950, 2000, 2050. So we've gone from bottom heavy to top heavy, so a lot more older people. But that's happening pretty much everywhere in the world. This is China. Um, this data was from 2016. And what do you notice there? You notice 25 to 29-year-olds, there's a lot of them, and a lot less 20 to 24-year-olds, and a lot less 15 to 19-year-olds. So we know that in 2026, how many Chinese 20 five to 29 year olds are gonna be. That can't be changed. We can't make more of them. Um, we know what it's gonna be. It's a trend and it's, it can't be changed. But what does this mean for China? It means the labor force, the incoming labor force is dropping drastically in China. Um, now, this is partially due to the one child policy which has recently been reversed in China, but that ain't gonna have an impact for a long time and people in China have got used to the idea of having only one kid and so the, it, it's going to be like this for a long time. A lot less people in China, the manufacturing powerhouse of the world. That the, these numbers from Japan, you know, already Japan is a, an old society with uh, over, tw over a quarter of it is 65 plus. That's going to go to well over a third in the next few years. A lot less working age people relative to retired people. 
Um, and so this is happening all over the world. Uh, the percentage of the adult population, which is in the workforce, has been going down slowly and is now going down dramatically over the next few years. We know this is going to happen. We can't change it. It's too late to change. And so it's going to be a whole lot of old people. Um, and, um, you know, this is going to be a lot of old. This actually is a picture I took 30 years from now in a time machine. Um, and this is what we're going to be like in 30 years. Those two guys on the left there, that's Peter and Alex. And Peter, <laughs> 30 years from now, and, and Alex is saying to Peter, remember before deep learning? We had to know what vision was about back then. And uh, that's me on the right. I'm totally out of it. And the guy with the hat on, that's Roger Tatila. He's, he's reviewing papers for ICRA 2048. He just won't <laughs> stop. Uh, okay, climate change. We know climate change is happening. Here's, here's something really scary, and how it's going to shift soils. And, and uh, look at Australia there. For people in Australia, what the hell's happening to Margaret River and Barossa Valley? We're not going to have wine at the end of the, end of the century. It's all going to move. Um, but we see in Europe, things getting dry. Uh, so farming is going to have to change quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> a lot of floods. Um, and uh, these are cities that are going to be inundated. So we're going to have to move about 200 major cities in the world, uh, move, build, do a lot of building to protect them, besides all the new cities we're going to build. This is just outside my office in Boston. This is from March. <coughs> um, <coughs> that's the world headquarters of GE on the left. Uh, it's not supposed to have water around it. Uh, this was a one in a hundred year flood event. It's happened twice since January of this year. Um, so things, we're going to have to fix the cities. And it's sort of a bit annoying in our building when there's water in the ground floor. Urbanization, um, we're going to be many, many more people living in cities than in the country. That's changing over this 150 year period, besides there being a lot more people. So enormous um, numbers of people moving to cities. Lots of building to do. Building is, is by the way, a terrible uh, with concrete for the carbon footprint. Um, and if you look at places like Europe, if you look at this data carefully, where the, the housing stock is old and needs to be replaced is where there is the lowest unemployment rates in, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in those areas. And we see all around the world people saying, well, you don't want immigrants anymore. Uh, and the immigrants have traditionally done a lot of the, the uh, construction work. Uh, so that's getting, causing some problems. So these three megatrends, demographic inversion, climate change, urbanization, are going to affect um, areas where robots can be applied. But I'm going to stick to just six of those. Um, Manufacturing, food production, construction, goods fulfillment, mobility services, and elder, elder services. And where they're green here, that says they, they're really going to be impacted. Needs, pulls on them are going to come from demographics, uh, some from climate change, and some from urbanization. And I left out some of the others because um, the ones I put there are, are not optional. Military, that's optional, whether you have robots or not. Uh, but these are existential for mankind. Uh, and we've got this population coming, and we've got this, this uh, climate change happening, and we've got aspirations. So in manufacturing, um, things have changed. Uh, Low-cost labor models have sort of run their course. For the last 30 years, the Western world relied on low-cost manufacturing in China. Well, guess what? China became a uh, highly educated, uh, high-wage country. There is no more great source of low-cost labor. And people are trying to uh, have short runs, um, do it locally where they can. Um, and uh, the demographics are also a challenge, uh, as we'll see in a minute. So, oh, and we'll see right here, in fact. In the US, the uh, median age of the manufacturing workforce is going up at about half the rate the wall clock is ticking. So it's getting older and older. And that's obviously not sustainable forever. And this, despite the political rhetoric, uh, oh, you know, manufacturing jobs are being taken away, it's just not true. There are lots and lots of manufacturing jobs that go unfilled. Um, <clears throat> of course, in, in China, we've had vast numbers of people working uh, in manufacturing. Um, many companies I talk to in China, well-run companies, have a labor turnover rate now of about 15 or 16% per month. Um, 
some as high as 30% per month. Imagine trying to run a business like that. So um, his, his people building robots in China. These are Roombas. Uh, so what, what that's meant is the jobs have been partitioned into very simple tasks where the training for a new worker just takes a few minutes, which actually makes it pretty good for robots to be able to fit in there. But robots have, in manufacturing have traditionally been like this. All robots know people. And for very high capital cost places, you can afford to, capital cost goods, you can afford to do that. But for low capital cost, or low, low cost goods, you can't afford to do that. It just doesn't make sense. So you have to be able to have the robots with the people close to them, which is what uh, my company's been working on for the last few years. In food production, we've actually had a lot of robots in the world for uh, many years. Uh, John Deere in the 90s started putting their Navstar system uh, with differential GPS in all their uh, retail outlets, their deep, uh, all across the US and in other countries, and they're getting centimeter accuracy of location of um, vehicles being driven autonomously in fields, often at the time with someone in the cabin, but increasingly less so in the cabin. And more recently, integrating that with uh, 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 data from satellites on uh, small regions of the field, where it's damper, where, and changing the seed that is put down in different parts of the field, and changing the fertilizer requirements. So we have had automation uh, and robotics in uh, farm for, for quite a while. But essentially, farming hasn't changed for about 10,000 years. The basic idea is you go out, you put the seed out there, complain about the weather for a few months, and then um, go and try and harvest. Um, now we're starting to see things move indoors. We've seen that with animal husbandry and now robotic solutions on the left, um, m cleaning up the, the food, et cetera. On the right, self-milking stations where the cows go to choose when they want to get milked. Uh, and, uh, uh, they are much happier about that. Uh, then we also see, and this is from Queensland University of Technology, this is uh, Peter Cork uh, on the left, picking uh, capskins or, or red peppers. I think the one on the right is faked, uh, uh, Peter. I don't think the Baxter actually picked that. It was a nicely framed shot. It was a nicely framed shot, okay. <laughs> um, <coughs> So we're seeing harvesting and, and changing the way plants are grown to make them easier to harvest. But we're also seeing indoor farming so we can get it closer to the end producer or end consumer and uh, uh, not have to rely on the weather. And basically reduce the amount of water by a factor of 10. But it's not actually going to be like this, I think, with people farming. It's going to have to be robotic farming for the large scale production of indoor farming. So there's going to be an incredible amount of robotics needed there. This is a uh, food uh, uh, preparation. This is actually from uh, a pla little place outside of Adelaide, South Australia, doing, um, you know, cutting meat. Uh, this is in China, doing chicken. A um, lot of, lot of uh, labor goes into food preparation, and it's repetitive. Uh, people get stress injuries. People do not aspire to these jobs. Um, actually, who, who has children? Now, keep your hand up if you aspire for your kids to have a job like uh, this. No one aspires to these jobs. And as people get better education, the standard of living goes up, they don't want to do them. Um, and people say, well, the poor people want those jobs. No, the poor people don't want these jobs. They're shitty jobs. Um, so we, we will need to automate them. Um, and then we've got this horrible factory type food production going on, which lays waste to the land. And so we're starting to see a different solution, which is um, growing meat without animals. And this is some, you know, we're getting, we're getting from this prototypes to early stage production, and we'll see more of that. But there's a whole chain of things that can happen there in automating this with robots over the next few years, food production. Construction is still very manual. In many places, people have to do a lot of things by hand. A lot of construction, the methods that are used, the Romans had. Um, you know, put, put a string covered in chalk and twang it down and you get the line that you need to be on. You have right angles, you put them together, which doesn't fit well with what we can do with CAD anymore. But it's very manual. That will need to change and become more robotified as this vast amount of construction needs to happen. And again, people don't actually aspire to these jobs. They're, they're sort of unpleasant. 
So people in robotics are trying to have whole building solutions, printing buildings, and that may come eventually, but um, there's still a lot of manual installation at the moment. It's not all automatic, but there's a lot of research that can be done there to reduce the labor content for building, and then maybe reduce the concrete content with different means of construction. So the things tied together. Goods fulfillment, we all know about. Warehouses used to be like this. Now warehouses are like this, with robots moving the shelves around uh, to, the, to the picker in the, the, in the purple shirt there. Well, now it's a red shirt. And because what do those pickers have that our robots don't? Those pickers have these things. These things are amazing, these hands. And for 40 years, we have been working on robot hands and the electric gripper, Osama, the electric gripper that my company sells looks just like the electric gripper from the yellow arm at Stanford AI Lab that's in the lobby of, Mar of, of, the, of Gates Hall. It hasn't changed in 40 years uh, what, 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 what robot hands are like. People do research on it, but it really hasn't got out into the world. The hands for robots have not changed. Although I'm sure um, uh, Ken, who's going to speak in here right after me, is going to talk about some, some changes. And then there's the last, last little delivery, mile of delivery, drones, little vehicles t carrying packages, a lot of things happening, no real deployment yet, but maybe that will come. But then this is the, uh, this is the bad part of houses, those, those last three meters getting up the stairs, <coughs> which is, I think Thung Bae Kim is here somewhere with his uh, cheetah robot. Did, did he bring a cheetah with him? But we all saw, uh, we've all seen, um, the Boston Dynamics mini spot, which is aimed at this last little little problem. <clears throat> um, another area, of course, is you know the, the most popular in the press, mobility as a service, um, where you know any day now we're going to have fully autonomous cars. Um, I, collect, I, I took a snapshot of these predictions in 2017, and the dates in. Um, Parentheses are when these predictions were made, and the dates in red are when they're predicting something's going to happen. Um, and some of them already, they, they'd sell by date as past. Uh, um, Elon Musk now expects first fully autonomous Tesla by 2018. No. Um, uh, next generation Audi A8 capable of fully autonomous driving in 2017. Does anyone have a fully autonomous 2017 Audi? Um, so, all these early years have been missed, and I expect they will continue to be missed. Um, and this is, gets to, you know, these cars are becoming robots, um, but it takes a while to get out there. This is a quiz for robotics people. When did a self-driving vehicle first travel 20 kilometers at 90 kilometers an hour down a public freeway? Anyone know? 1987, yes. Um, Ernst Dickmans. I think, you know, the press thinks it just happened, uh, you know, in the 2007, but it's, it was around for 20 years before that. It's hard to get from the early um, uh, showing of a prototype to actual deployment, and that's where we still are. When, when do you think the first, you know, uh, Elon Musk predicted this a little while ago, when he was going to have a car drive coast to coast in the U.S., hands-free? When, when, when do you think that will happen? 1995, that's when it first happened. Um, so everyone sort of thinks, oh, this, this stuff's shiny and new. It's about to be deployed. We've already had a tale of 30 years trying to get there. It's going to take a little longer. And once we have it, everyone's concentrating on the driving. But there's a whole lot of other dynamics that the human driver does. Mobility as a service. What does the Uber driver do? The Uber driver refuels the car. Worries about that. Um, removes things left behind by previous passengers. Locates passengers to pick them up. They, they, they see you on the street, they, they come over and they pull into a bus zone illegally to pick you up. They do all sorts of things. They, uh, they wake up drunk passengers to kick them out. Um, so uh, decide to break the rules. In my neighborhood in, in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, I cannot drive a single day without breaking a traffic rule. I have to cross double yellow lines every day in order to drive. About once every three weeks, I have to drive the wrong way down a one-way street. And, uh, just, just can't get around. Um, so most of the self-driving efforts and the startups that are getting sold for obscene amounts of money to big, big companies are concentrating on the road, and there's all this other stuff on the right, 
that mostly is not being worried about. We're starting to see just the first few people worrying about. So there's a lot of stuff to do. Elder services. This is, if you search, search for elder care, these are the happy images you get on the, on the Google machine. This is not what it's like in real life. It is not this happy. Um, but people are, you know, giving services to the elderly, helping them exercise, helping them get up from a, 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 a couch. What, and what do we see here? We see people manipulating other people, physically manipulating them. With this demographic age inversion, there's not going to be enough young people to do these jobs. In Australia, in the US, most of these jobs are done by very recent immigrants as a first job when they enter the country. Then they move on to something else. That, again, is not sustainable. Uh, and, and all sorts of services for the elderly. And eventually, people can't get into and out of bed, and, uh, and tr the, it is not this happy. If someone needs a crane to get in and out of bed, it is not a happy time. Uh, it's very difficult, this task. So, um, I think that the elderly are going to want to stay in their homes and they want two things, dignity and independence. So, some people talk about robots to be companions for the elderly. I think of robots more as letting people maintain their independence longer in their homes and give them dignity and not have to rely on other people to help them go to the bathroom, help them wash themselves. But if we can have robotic machines doing that, it lets people age in their home and, and lead independent lives longer. We start to see research in some countries, especially Japan, on this, but I think this is a big area that we need to concentrate on, which involves robots and people being intimate with each other in a way that we haven't seen before. And by the way, inside houses, there's, there's these horrible things called stairs, again, which get in the way of these robots. <coughs> and, and, and here's a picture from, um, uh, from 2006 of a, a simulation of a, of a kitchen, you know, for a simulated robot. That's a nice kitchen. Uh, this is from Aaron Edsinger's PhD thesis. This was his kitchen. Um, that's what real kitchens look like. And they're very narrow getting around in there and then manipulating those objects is very different from the, the happy papers that people write about their simulated robot working in, in the real world. We do have, and this gets back to self-driving, these, these sorts of things with driver assist features are helping the elderly maintain their independence and drive longer. So that, that is good. Um, so these are all the sorts of things that uh, um, uh, we'll need robots for from these mega trends. But I want to um, say that how robots and people interact is going to be crucial for this successful world. We can't just put the robot out there and expect people to understand how to use it. And it's got to interact with people in interesting and difficult ways. And so now I'm going to go on a rant. Um, this is my rant about Human-robot interaction research, sorry. Sorry. Uh, this is my cynical view of HRI research. If, until a couple of years ago, I characterized most papers as you know, doing an A-B test, 60% of the people preferred A and the other two preferred B. Peter got the joke. <laughs> that has changed. Now what we see is hundreds of subjects using Mechanical Turk and when I say hundreds, it's always between 100 and 200. It's not, never 500 or 1,000, but using Mechanical Turk, and maybe tens of subjects interacting with a physical robot. But people are not using robots today. So you get these people off the street, and you ask them these questions, what do you prefer? They have nothing invested in it. They don't care about the task intrinsically. They're just research subjects. They don't understand how it would be placed in the real world. They don't have that conception. And it's not something they can imagine impacting their own lives. With the Roomba, we didn't go and ask people, how do you want your robot vacuum cleaner to work? Because they couldn't have given us any answer. They could tell us how much they could spend on an impulse purchase. We didn't say it was for a robot, by the way, uh, because that was something they couldn't conceive of. A robot in your home back in 2002, that was not something people were thinking about. So I sort of, this is my, this is my version of human-robot interaction research, but as it may have, today's human robot, this is a 
tricky here. Today's human-robot interaction research applied to human-computer interaction in the 1970s. And, you know, this is my cynical sort of uh, imagined view of a 1970s HCI experiment. You know, you're testing for utility versus expressiveness, and you, you know, use RM or delete file, MKDIR or make directory, LS, list directory. And you ask people which they prefer. You, you give them a task to do a complex task, manipulating uh, and renaming, reorganizing files, and see which they prefer. But remember who people of the 70s were. They had never seen a directory structure, most of them. There were just a few nerds who had used computers. They certainly didn't know about tree-based uh, directory structures. And so asking them to do this task was sort of asking them to do something they had no motivation to do. And so if people were doing this in the late 70s, they would have forgotten to uh, integrate pointing devices, pop-up windows, cut and paste, everything else. And I think that's sort of where we are with a lot of human-robot interaction research. It's looking down at the micro level and not at the macro level of inventing the important stuff that 50 years from now will say, oh, yeah, remember when the, that person, uh, uh, Professor Howard, came up with you know, this fantastic new way of interacting with a robot, for instance. Please do it. Um, uh, just like you know, we now say, oh, remember when, when uh, Douglas Engel, Engelbart you know, first invented the mouse? We've got we to have people inventing these new ways of using things. At the same time, a lot of HRI papers, and I will, I can't tell you how much it upsets me when I hear a talk on HRI research and someone says, and we found a statistical significant difference, statistically significant, significant difference between these two methods. P-values in general, uh, you know, they get thrown throughout papers on, on HRI research. If you've got to have statistics to prove that your idea is good, you don't have a good idea, is my, is my argument. And P-values in general are under, under threat. They're misused across psychology. They're misused everywhere. They become very controversial. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's in general psychology, general biology, general medical re science research. It's happening in HRI research too. And then reproducibility. Um, a lot of medical, biological experiments are not reproducible. I suspect most, most HRI research is not reproducible. And if, this is a big if, if I was, you know, back being an obnoxious young researcher. Now, I'm not an obnoxious young researcher. I was. Now I'm an obnoxious old bloviator. But if I was an obnoxious young researcher, this is what I would do. This would be fun. I would take someone big in the field of HRI, pick a paper by a well-known researcher that, had a, that used mechanical Turk subjects and had some barely significant result. And then I'd try and reproduce it. I'd reproduce the experiment using precisely the description in the paper, but I'd make 10 different versions of it and vary stuff that wasn't mentioned in the paper. And I might hill climb to get a different result, you know, by having particular wording, um, relative font sizes, ordering the options, and I would try to, you know, then publish two versions of the experiment with opposite results. I'm not an obnoxious young researcher, and I don't know that anyone out there is, but I'd like to see it. <laughs> so if you're an HRI researcher, I think you should chart, stop and check yourself. And I'm sorry for going on, but I, I, I think we need to do better. I think we need to be more inventive. Notation that's got, and this is true for a lot of robotics papers, lots of superscripts and subscripts and different fonts, the reason for having notation is so you can compositionally create an argument, not just to describe something. And you know, I've seen papers where the same notation has different versions of the same equation in the paper, and the, the researchers haven't noticed that the equation's different because the, the, uh, the notation is so baroque that they're not actually reading it. It's, it's there for show. <clears throat> and here's another thing. If you're paying people pennies on Mechanical Turk, as a way to study robot ethics? Mmm. Mmm. And this, I love this one. When you say that human subjects give different results in the pages of theory, predict because they must be using a different cost function. Those bad humans using the wrong cost function inside their heads. Oh, it's okay. We will use machine learning to learn it. Oh, the heavens open. Music comes down. Machine learning will solve it all. Yeah. And if, this, if you use Bayes' rule and argmax to, to, uh, to argue, you know, this is clearly why people don't believe in UFOs, 
Next thing you're going to be predicting Rust Belt voters in the US and where they're going. So if you need to cloak yourself in maths, when, uh, then ask yourself why you're naked in the first place is my argument on this. So, sorry, it's the end of the rant. I just had to get that out. <laughs> um, I, I, if I did offend anyone then, well, too bad. Um, change what you're doing. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just now, now going to show a little video of what my company's been doing for the last three years, um, in, and that is how we can let people get robots to do complex things without writing programs. We used to hide it all from them in our early versions of our software, but we got people complained that they couldn't see what was really going on underneath. So we've got a whole new version of the software which uses behavior trees. Behavior trees uh, were uh, developed by Damien Isler at the Media Lab. Sometimes good things come out of the Media Lab um, as, a, as a variation of behavior-based robots. And they are now used in billions of, billions of uh, uh, computer games. That is the fundamental engine for computer gaming now, behavior trees. And so when our robots now, when you show them what to do, they write a program in behavior trees underneath. You don't have to look at that. Our, um, our machinists in that little factory in Connecticut never looked at it. They just showed it what to do and the robot did what it wanted. But other people at more sophisticated places want to go in and look at the behavior trees. So let's just look at this little video um, of, uh, within Terra 5 of showing the robot what to do and how it creates these behavior trees. It makes inferences. The fingers are apart, he closes the fingers, and now it feels something between the fingers, so it figures out it's a pick by closing fingers. It could have been a pick by opening fingers, but that was by closing fingers. This is a put down by a place, and it builds this tree and, um, of, of what was just asked for, a pick followed by a place. But you can go click on them and see all the conditions that are in there, the failure conditions, uh, how, to, how to do stuff for both the pick and place, if you want to go and look. And you can um, then watch what happens as the program is running and the green is showing where it is in the behavior tree. So if you're trying to figure out what the hell's going on, you can, you can figure out where something's going wrong. Here, here it's getting one of the error conditions because it couldn't, couldn't pick it up. Um, so there's contextual information there and you can go click on any of these nodes and change all the details below. But you don't have to understand this stuff. So if you've got a, uh, you know, this is, you don't want this level of exposure for a, an elder care robot which helps you get into and out of bed, although maybe you, the, the engineers have programmed it underneath in this sort of methodology, so they don't have to be programmers to do this. And, and here's just showing how to make a pattern instead of a single place. You can also, uh, so uh, uh, here he's just showing the corners of the, um, where the pattern is. It shows up on the, when, when this is done in, uh, uh, with the, um, in a certain mode, it shows up, this shows up on the screen of the robot or it can show up on a, on a remote screen. Um, this is a slightly different version in the video of the robot there than what's in the, uh, this next piece. This is saying it was a five by five instead of a five by two. But um, you, 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 know, you have these options, these wizards which let you do patterns, wizards which let you do localization because often those trays have, have uh, texture on them and you, uh, to show it how to find that tray visually. And um, you can uh, also program uh, impedance control and all sorts of uh, force interactions by going in and then having the robot um, feel those forces and interact. So this is the sort of user interface which didn't come from A-B testing. It came from going out and talking to hundreds and hundreds of people with our robots in factories. What did you find hard? What was easy? Putting those in Briggs spreadsheets not doing significance testing, but by hearing, listening to the customers, hearing what their biggest problems were and going after those problems first and, and, and going down the line. So, and then this is just, uh, uh, you can even get data up to the cloud now without knowing anything about the cloud just by saying we want, a, we want cycle time, we want this, we want that. It all goes, simple things are simple to do, complex things can be done for this particular robot. So, I, I ranted against HRI research. I wanted to show the HRI stuff that I've been doing the last few years just so you can decide how much of a bloviator I really am. It's, it's fair. So if we're going to have these robots that work with people in all these tasks, I, I, I think there's a few things we should aim for. We've got deep learning doing 
image labeling, but it's very different from how a two-year-old understands images and understands things. So if you get the object recognition capabilities of a two-year-old child, that would be great. Language understanding. We've got Alexa, but it doesn't understand language like a four-year-old child understands language. It's got about a good uh, uh, noise, signal to noise ratio as, a, as a, an, an accent, which we didn't have just a few years ago, but it doesn't have the richness of language where you can discuss language with Alexa and debug things. Manual dexterity of a six-year-old child. A six-year-old child cannot usually play Chopin, but they can tie shoelaces, or could when we had shoelaces. Um, they can do manual things, which are interesting, much more than any of our robots can do today. Social understanding of an eight-year-old child, understanding what another person could know from what you have seen them just see and make inferences about what is known so you don't have to go through stupid menus and ask them the same question again and again. You know, every time I go to the bank in the US, I've been doing, I've, got, I've been to the same, uh, the same bank for 30 years. Every time I put my um, ATM card in, it asks me whether I want to speak Spanish. <laughs> no, I, today I don't want to speak Spanish. <laughs> um, so, you know, a model of the other person can help with how that works. Now, 2468, what's the age of the next one? No. The strength of an 18-year-old. An 18-year-old has enough strength to manipulate, whole arm manipulate a human. And I think that's an important goal that we're gonna need for elder care. Um, we don't have robots that can do that yet. And if we did, we'd be pretty scared of them. Uh, but I think that's something we need to work on. So meanwhile, I want all of you to go out and be these people. Do the great things. Um, don't send any more papers to Peter. There's enough papers. <laughs> Go and invent great stuff. Thank you. I think we're going to take questions. So I think Alex is going to choose who gets to ask me questions. He did ask me ahead of time if there's anyone I didn't want a question from, and I said <laughs> I'll take questions from everybody. So. All right, Rod, so very good. As always, thought provocative and always showing us a different way of thinking. So we've got time for a few questions. So just put your hand up and we've got roving mics. You see anyone? You've scared them all, Rod. So. <laughs> a lot of HRI researchers up there. <laughs> Have we got one there? Who's up there? Up the back, yeah? Okay. Got a mic too. Yeah, th th thank you very much for this inspiring talk. So I have a philosophical question. So assuming that the ICT and robotics will reach the level, and this is the an hypothesis where some philosophers are discussing now. The, the what and the robot will? The will reach a certain level where we don't need human labor at all. I think that all the automation, the ICT, will allow ICT. any human being do not need to work anymore. So in your opinion, in such a vision, how do you see the society of the future? Yeah, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great hypothetical question, but I think it is so hypothetical, um, and we're so far from that, that we can't say anything sensible. Um, you know, it, it, in, in my blog about the seven deadly sins of predicting the future of AI, that's what I call the Hollywood problem. The Hollywood problem is where you have the world just like it is today, and you plunk down some, some singular technology, and it makes the world different. But we didn't, it, that doesn't happen in real life. The technologies develop gradually. And right now, robots are doing hardly anything that humans do. In industrial robots, there's two million of them worldwide. There are hundreds of millions of people working in manufacturing worldwide. So it's a tiny, tiny, tiny piece. And there is no reason to believe that it's gonna change drastically anytime soon. I I've been working on pushing as hard as I can for, for, for 10 years to, to change that, but it's very, very slow. Um, we are, you know, we, we've sort of gotten used to the idea that, that new technology downloads over your browser and it happens instantly, but out in the real world with capital equipment and physical devices and software that doesn't get upgraded more than once every 10 years, things move much more slowly. So I think the world, we may get to that point at some far distant future, but the world will be so different from what it is today that we won't be able to think, we can't think about what that might mean at the moment. I know some people find that unsatisfying, but it's not gonna happen within 
100 years, so we can't think about it. Sorry, we can't say anything sensible, no matter how fun it seems to speculate about this. There's other issues that we do have to worry about in the short term, and that is uh, the security, uh, the privacy, that all these devices will open up all sorts of questions to, uh, uh, and that's things that we do have to worry about in the short term. But these other things, I think, are not going to happen for a long, long time, and we better not spend our time worrying about that and ignoring the stuff that's really going to impact us in the next 20, 30, 40 years in horrible ways, perhaps. So we have to be careful. Very good. So probably got time for one or one more question. I think there's someone over here. Yep. Wait for the mic. Uh, I, I do robot learning, and the, and the question has been bothering me a lot more and more recently. It's, unfortunately, I can't see where you are, where was talking. Person, please stand up. Who's talking? Uh, oh, up there. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. I just want to see who I'm, yeah. I appreciate. Uh, so the, the thing is, uh, I agree with you very much that robots today are less capable intelligently than the new human newborn. And we need the robots to be able to at least uh, reach physically and, and mentally to the status of a, say, a teenager. But the problem is, uh, if it looks like a duck, and it works like a duck, it is a duck. And uh, by the time when the robot is kind of like a human teenager, then we are talking about the child slavery. And, and uh, that question has been bothering me more and more. So if one day we can really realize that kind of robot intelligence, then the question is, why have we bothered so much and invested so long why didn't people just bring back slavery, like bail slavery from the very beginning? Okay, so again, that's a long-term view. It's a long term before we're gonna have to face that. I do like the fact that I do not have to worry about the ethics of my refrigerator working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so I think we can do a lot of these things with, and will have to for the next uh, many decades with much simpler devices um, that do not bring up these ethical issues. I think that is a long way away. But also, we also have to be aware of the status of the machine. I think we just saw a, 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 an unfortunate experiment from Google with Google Duplex where it seemed like this um, conversational agent was talking to a person, demanding their respect as a person, even though it was a pretty dumb conversational agent. So I think we have to be very careful on how we build our robots, because the way they appear and the way they sound are making a promise about how intelligent they are. They will not be super intelligent for a long time, so we better make sure that they only promise what they can deliver on, because otherwise you're sort of um, hijacking human emotions in, in, in ways which I think are somewhat immoral. Uh, and we have to be careful about that. I think, was, was there another question? Yeah. One last one, one last question. Hi, um, do you still believe in subsumption about building complex capabilities out of simple capabilities? And yeah, how do you contrast that with deep learning bandwagon? Well, deep, uh, yes, um, bandwagon <laughs> is a good, good, good phrase. Um, I still believe in building things from simple stuff that, uh, you know, I've delivered 20 million plus 10,000 plus 10,000, you know, robots using that methodology. Most of the robots in the world today actually use that by number. Um, uh, deep learning is doing, is, is, is doing a very different thing. Uh, it's used it, and it's been uh, remarkable what it can do in certain aspects, but I think people overgeneralize it. And this, if you go to my blog and look at my seven deadly sins, this is the deadly sin of confusing performance with competence. When a person produces some performance, we have a good model of how that performance generalizes to a general competence. And that model that works for humans does not work for deep learning or any of the machine learning techniques. And I think people are making mistakes about that. So I view you know, the output of a deep learning thing, some sort of recognizer, as just being a, a little, little piece that you could put in a subsumption -y architecture in a behavior-based uh, system. Um, but because that deep learning is not learning the whole thing, it's a little piece of a much larger thing. Thank you.
We have to finish there. So let's thank Rod and Books for a fantastic talk.